Hello everyone, you are very welcome and welcome back to those of you who have already joined us for our overview session this morning. Thank you for joining us to launch the Transport Outlook 2021, ITF's flagship publication. In this session, we are going to focus on the results for urban mobility more closely. And I will be joined by my colleagues, Mallory Trouvé and Joshua Patinina Blanco to, to present the results for this chapter. We will then be joined for more in-depth discussion by our distinguished guest, Marusha Kardama, the Secretary General of the SLOCAP Partnership. Throughout this session, I invite you to please use the Q&A box on your screen to submit questions. And you will also be able to see a poll question, just a quick poll to get your thoughts on a question related to urban mobility, uh, which will inform some of the discussion later. And the poll will remain open during the presentation. So please do take a look and submit your preferences. There is also a discussion box, which is there for participants to discuss amongst themselves, but I would ask you to please note that ITF staff will not be monitoring or moderating the content in this discussion box. So again, any questions you wish to be addressed by the participants, please include them in the Q&A box. Finally, should you experience any technical difficulties, you will see a small red live support button to the top right hand corner of your screen. And I would invite you to please use that to communicate with the technical team to get help. And with that, I will now ask Mallory and Joshua to present the outlook findings for urban mobility. And I believe Mallory, you're to speak first, please. Thank you, Ola. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Mallory Trouvé, and I'm going to present uh, the results for the urban passenger transport sector from the ITF Transport Outlook 2021 with my colleague Joshua Paternina Blanco. We want to highlight first that Maliti Fernando is also an author of uh, this analysis. So in this session, we will focus on how cities can make mobility sustainable, equitable, and resilient. So first, a quick reminder of, of what uh, has just been said in, uh, in the introductory session. So the ITF Transport Outlook 2021 aims on uh, producing estimations of transport demand, CO2 emissions, and other indicators such as resilience, accessibility. These uh, estimations are between 2015 and 2050. In order to do so, we built three main policy scenarios. So first, the recover scenario, which is the current trajectory where the policies that we are implementing right now are leading us. The reshape scenario, which is a paradigm shift from the recover scenario. Uh, basically, it's the same policies, but with a higher uptake. So for instance, higher congestion charging, quicker ve vehicle electrification, or stronger incentives for active and micro mobility. And last, the reshape plus scenario, which is a, a reinforced reshape, building on a stronger recovery from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So while the ITF Transport Outlook encompasses all of the transport sector, this session focuses on urban passenger transport, meaning the daily mobility of people in a city setting. All of the urban areas over the world are considered in this analysis. So I'll start by presenting the main findings of our analysis, and then my colleague Joshua will present the main takeaways that we can draw from this. So first, an observation. According to the UN, the urban population is set to increase by 68% by 2050. This is a strong growth, which is also combined with an expected economic growth of urban areas, which translates into a, a strong growth of urban travel demand, which is expected to almost triple by 2050. So there is the huge pressure on the demand side of urban passenger transport. When we look at the emissions that are, that are produced by the urban tra passenger transport sector, if we stay on the current trajectory, they roughly remain the same. But if we uh, have more ambitious policies and if we leverage the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemics, then we could aim at, reduce, at reducing these emissions in 2050 by almost 80%. That would be reduced by a fifth. This is, uh, this is necessary if we want uh, to uh, reach the goal set by, um, by the climate agreements. 
when we look at how uh, these emissions are produced, which modes are producing them, uh, it appears that private vehicles are responsible for 75% of these emissions, which is very significant. Uh, what is, uh, we must uh, also consider that they only represent 51% of the demand. So we can say that private vehicles today are the highest emitting mode. They're also very space in intensive, especially when you have just one people per, per car, for instance. They are not available to everyone because it's expensive to purchase or maintain such vehicles. But the paradox is that most of the transport systems are designed for them. So a lot of the urban space is dedicated to the use of private vehicles. The goal here is not to say that private vehicles are bad because they are an interesting solutions, but the way we use them today is not efficient enough if we want to reach the goals of climate agreements. And last, um, the resilience uh, topic is uh, one that we wanted to address in this uh, ITF Transport Outlook 2021, but uh, it's fairly difficult to address it because there are many definitions of resilience. In this analysis, we consider resilience as uh, the model diversity of uh, a city. So basically, there is the assumption that, um, we make the assumption that uh, the higher the model diversity, uh, the better the system will be able to, uh, to answer a disruption of a certain mode. So when we look at 2015 and 2050 under the current trajectory, the equilibrium roughly stays the same. Uh, we just note the operation of shared mobility uh, in the cur current trajectory. While if we look at, uh, at the ambitious policies and uh, leverage recovery from COVID-19, we have a much stronger uptake of shared mobility and of active mobility at the expense of private vehicle and paratransit mode shares. So the system becomes more resilient. So the conclusion of this is that increasing the variety of sustainable modes can increase resiliency. So now I hand uh, the screen uh, to uh, my colleague Joshua, who will present the main takeaways. Thank you, Mallory. So to present our four main takeaways. The first one is that Two main strategies are needed to be able to better manage demand and deliver sustainable transport services across the world. One strategy for developing regions and another one for developed regions. So if we look at the graph at the left, we see the evolution of per capita transport demand in developed uh, in dark blue and developing regions in light blue from 2015 to 2050. We can see that in the current trajectory, if ambition is not increased, Demand is going to increase slightly in OECD countries, but it's going to do so massively in non-OECD ones. As a result of this, as we see in the graph in the right, per capita CO2 emissions are going to stay roughly the same in 2050 as they were in 2015 in non-OECD countries. They're not going to decrease as much as they should have in OECD ones for us to meet wider environmental sustainability objectives. Now, to be able to face this very unsustainable situation, two strategies are needed. One in developing world regions is to leapfrog unsustainable uh, demand growth patterns. This is to say, to move away from the trend of having high levels of long distance mobility by unsustainable modes, but rather focusing in transport innovations which can, can, can help deliver a more sustainable future. In developed regions, on the other hand, the idea is to optimize the very high levels of already existing transport demand, for instance, by increasing vehicle occupancy rates. Now, a second takeaway is that there is a common policy principle that can help achieve these two strategies for developing and developed regions alike. This principle is crucial, and it is to increase access to nearby opportunities and having this policy priority for instance, by integrating transport policy and land use planning. The idea behind this is to create cities that are neighborhood centric. Imagine cities where it will be possible to reach essential opportunities such as school, work opportunities, shops or hospitals, very close to where we live and where mobility systems are designed to this end. Now, if we do this, first, we can shorten distances of trips. 
And then those trips that we do, we can do them by walking, by cycling, or by using public transport in a way that's cost effective for authorities with the right policies that think about equity and the social sustainability of systems. It will be possible with this policy approach to really increase access for all, for those who do not own a private vehicle, but also for those who have a particular impairment or who are otherwise disadvantaged by the current mobility system. Now let's look just at some of the potential impacts that such an approach could have. As you see in the left, if we increase ambition and aim at increasing access for all, by 2050, demand still increases, but much less than if we didn't have this approach. And the important thing is that if we increase ambition and leverage on the COVID-19 pandemic recovery, for instance, for increasing sustainable modes such as cycling in cities around the world, then it will be possible to double emission reductions that we could have by 2050. There is a third takeaway, which is that a common principle behind all of these measures is to reduce the reliance on private vehicles for decarbonizing cities. Without such an approach, it will not be possible to really decarbonize our cities around the world. Increasing ambition means to reflect the real cost of using a car for society, but also to improve vehicle technologies in a way that can deliver cleaner fleets. Now, if ambition doesn't change by 2050, private vehicles will fulfill 40% of demand and emit around 50% of emissions stemming from the urban passenger transport sector. But with more ambition, if we leverage correctly on the COVID-19 pandemic recovery, around one third of demand would be answered by private vehicles. And these private vehicles would emit less than one third of all emissions. Now, it's important to provide a real alternative to private vehicle use, especially in lower income areas, so that we don't leave anybody behind and people can still move in spite of these changes on priority away from private vehicle use. But what does it mean to provide alternatives? And this is our fourth takeaway. It means to create a multimodal urban transport system that has public transport at its backbone. And for this, integrating public transport and shared mobility services is going to be essential. First, because this integration can offer last mile connectivity in areas where previously existing public transport services couldn't reach because of low levels of demand. But then it can also make the use of transport vehicles more efficient. So imagine that instead of having one person in one vehicle, we could have three or four. Of course, emissions per capita and the consequences of cars per capita uh, would be less in such an approach. If we think about this and provide also a reliable, frequent, clean and safe transport system for all, and in safety, we need to think particularly about women, it will be possible to attract new users. And this is the key for a more sustainable future. So just to wrap up, we have four main facts and takeaways that come from this presentation. First, urbanization will increase demand for sustainable transport around the world. And to better manage demand, it will be needed to leapfrog on sustainable demand patterns in developing regions, but then also to optimize existing demand in developed ones. With the right policies, it will be possible in the second place to cut around 80% of urban mobility's carbon footprint by 2050, and this is great, but this will only be possible if we have an approach that focuses on providing access for uh, nearby opportunities for all. Now, this means a way that we uh, look at the current emission of private vehicles, three quarters of CO2 emissions, and we aim at reducing the reliance on private vehicles for really decarbonizing our cities. This can allow having a more sustainable system, which can also increase resilience. Such a system will only be possible if we have public transport as the backbone of multimodal transport sustainable cities for the future. Thank you very much. And I hand up the mic to the moderator, Orla. Thank you for your attention. Thank you both very much for that overview of the urban mobility results for the outlook. 
And uh, I can see many of our participants are responding to that poll. Some interesting results coming in. I would encourage you to please continue to do so for the next few minutes. And I will close the poll after Marusha has spoken. Uh, I would also encourage you, if you have more specific questions for our presenters, to please use the Q&A function to submit them so that we can discuss them later in the session. Well, it is now my great pleasure to invite Marusha Kardama, the Secretary General of the SLOWCAT Partnership, to join us. Uh, Marusha, you are very welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today and for sharing your insights and thoughts on some of those results. Thank you so very much, Ola. Thanks to Mallory and to Joshua and also to Melithi for the amazing job. The first thing I should do is really congratulate you. It's never easy to pull one of these big outlook reports together and particularly doing it in the year that you had to do it. So congratulations, phenomenal urban chapter. And there is a few things, perhaps six things that have particularly caught my attention and I would like to underscore here. The first one is really congratulate you for putting really social aspects at the center of your analysis. You're really making us see how uh, access to mobility and resilience of mobility systems at the end are absolutely central to the resilience of urban communities. And at the end of the day, you're also helping us understand the extent to which it is about democratizing the access to mobility, democratizing the shared use of public space, and therefore democratizing the access to socioeconomic opportunities, which at the end of the day is what transport is all about. Another thing that I like a lot about the outlook this year is the extent to which it is anchored on the avoid, shift and improve framework. And in that order, how much you're underscoring that first, we need to reduce the need for motorized trips in cities to then shift to less carbon intensive modes to finally look into the uh, efficiency of vehicles and, and, and of, 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 of fuels. And actually I like the way how you're presenting that that sequence is very feasible if we really take the right ambitious policies. Another thing that I like a lot about the outlook and is connected to this framework of hierarchies of strategies is that you're not shying away from actually telling us the, uh, the very bad things about the prevalent rates of, uh, of private car use Sometimes I think, what is it that as a sustainable low carbon transport movement we could be doing in order to help us shift away from these say, car dependent lifestyles that we've got? I think that perhaps something that we could do is tell better the data, the very concrete data to decision makers and citizens of the cost of not acting on this excessive use of our private cars. Costs in terms of inequality, of air pollution, of road crashes, of a productivity uh, because of the loss of time in congestion, isn't it? And, and of course, that means as well telling the story about the uh, savings for the public uh, policy areas and the great economies of scale that they are derived. I think that we might also want to tell the story of not depending so much on our cars in a wider framework, society wide framework for equitable, healthy, low carbon lifestyles, inserting the less dependency on cars in that, uh, in that wider conversation. A fourth thing that I like a lot is the extent to which you are reminding us that centrality of public transport as the backbone of any mobility system in a city. I could say any system that really wants to be about equity and that really wants to be a low carbon one. I think that we also need to understand that in this moment in which we are trying to rejuvenate the life of our cities after the pandemic, if we allow public transport systems to collapse, we are only going to exacerbate other series of crises that are already ongoing. The social inequality crisis, the air pollution crisis, and of course the emissions crisis. So it's really time to support local governments, which as we know are really carrying on their shoulders in many instances, the burden of delivering public transport services to urban dwellers. A fifth thing that I appreciate a lot from your outlook is those three scenarios. You're really raising the ambition bar. You're really making a clear case for the right type of investments. You're providing sound knowledge for policymakers. So what is it that I think we expect from the policymakers? I think that we expect, as you are also saying, those integrated and intermodal uh, uh, metropolitan transport plans. We know we've been talking about them over many years, and we know that they still are an outstanding matter in many geographies. To change the tide, we are really going to have to see a much increased number of national urban uh, mobility plans and sustainable urban mobility plans across different geographies. And perhaps we're going to have to understand them not just as that isolated measure, but as a package of integrated intermodal measures at that metropolitan scale that actually sells mobility and understands mobility 
as a service to, to, to citizens. How can we support policymakers? Well, probably I think that organizations such as ours, we can look into more support to political, uh, to, to local elected representatives support at the technical and at the political level in the use of regulatory mechanisms, whether it is establishing low emission zones, whether it is introducing congestion charges that we know are difficult moves sometimes to, 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 to take, isn't it? And we probably need to support much better the transport professionals. So we truly integrate, as you were saying, spatial planning, land use, urban development, and transport planning. I very much uh, concur with Joshua. I think that this refreshed interest in, in urban and transport planning policies that are based on proximity, like the 15 minute city, really carry a lot of potential for us to build upon. And the last thing that I appreciate a lot from this outlook is your very clear recommendation in the, in the urban mobility uh, chapter about prioritizing funding for sustainable urban transport development. I think that it is time to reinterpret what we consider is added value for investments in urban transport. We have seen over the past decade, a lot of calls from many different voices telling us to what extent there is sustainability and low carbon benefits for these type of investments. Still, the adequate investment at scale doesn't exist everywhere, particularly in the global south. So I could say that as, as we are seeing an unprecedented amount of money being mobilized in recovery packages, it will be as essential as ever that we understand transport uh, policies at the urban level, also as financing and investment schemes, sending very specific signals about what should and should not be actually invested in, financed over the next decade, because that next decade is gonna determine the urban mobility transformations that are gonna be feasible. And I would close with saying that perhaps what we need to do is interrogate any investment in urban transport over the next few years, according to the gains it can actually give us across the impact areas. And to me, those three impact areas would be access to mobility with different options, could be reducing carbon emissions, and would also be the aspect of generating jobs, because we know that around improved measures, around technology measures, there is a beautiful story there to be told of a jobs generation, for instance, around electric mobility. Absolutely. So congratulations again. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you today. And over to you, Orla. Thank you. Thank you, Marusha. A lot of food for thought there, both for policymakers, I think, but also for us as analysts in how we can support them to take those policies forwards. Um, so I will now end the poll. We have quite a number of results. And if we could share the results, please. Great. Thank you very much. So um, this question was about decarbonisation measures for urban mobility. And there was a mixture of, you know, sort of mode shift, long term planning and drivers of demand type questions. And what is interesting to me, at least, is that there is no runaway um, measure that has attracted a, a large majority of the votes or indeed a majority of the votes at all. But what we can see is that mode shift, the promotion of active mobility and the promotion of public transport have both come out at around the 16, 17% mark of um, proportion of responses as being the, the measures that participants would suggest for the decarbonisa decarbonisation of urban passenger transport. So Marusha, perhaps we could quickly just pop back to you, please. Do you have any thoughts on this result? I mean, it's super interesting, Orla, because to some extent, um, I think that uh, uh, the notion is what do we think authorities should be doing? <laughs> or what do we think would be the easiest for them to do, isn't it? And obviously, depending on what level of government we would be talking about, it would be easier or less easy for certain levels of government, local level, national level or national level to act, depending on the on the country we would be at. Uh, very, uh, I think, heartwarming to see that everybody understands that that behavioral change that we've seen in patterns towards active mobility is to be harnessed. I think that uh, hopefully we will, we will see the prevailing uh, hurdles for uh, bringing up to scale infrastructure for active mobility removed with recovery message, uh, measures and all these say, uh, temporary approaches to tactical urbanism that have been so cost efficient to be harnessed as permanent irreversible change in our cities across different geographies. I am very pleased to see public transport so highly scoring there. I cannot sufficiently underscore how central it is for us to work on it, but not, let's not take for granted that it's gonna be easy. In many countries around the world, local authorities are not accessing the financing schemes needed in order to actually keep the services running. Let's look back what just a couple of months ago to New York. A city like New York was actually struggling to keep 
public transit alive. So I think we have to be mindful of, of that, absolutely. Interesting, I don't know how did it score the measures about um, uh, pricing mechanisms, because interestingly, they might not be easy, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't forget that governments, authorities have got the power of regulation. And therefore, you know, we could hope that they could use that power of regulation for changing uh, mobility paradigms in our cities. But enough from me, because I would love to hear from others, of course. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Marusha. And just um, so participants understand, our speakers can't actually see the poll results. So Marusha, pricing mechanisms did not do too badly. It got about 9%. Um, apart from the two that we spoke about in terms of modes, everything else ranged between about 7 and 12%. So I think there's probably reflecting of the fact that there isn't a silver bullet solution, but that um, it, it's going to be a mixed bag of measures that are required. So thank you very much for your thoughts on that. I will now ask Mallory to perhaps um, share some comments from the ITF perspective on those results, please. Thank you, Ola. Um, thank you, Marusha, for, for your comments and, uh, and for uh, your first interpretation of these polls. Um, I would add a more Another perspective from the modeling side, uh, when uh, we uh, developed this uh, outlook, we really wanted to go over the traditional transport sector analysis, which is based on travel demand and CO2 emissions, but to integrate the social aspects and the resilience aspects. And uh, it's something that we tried to do in this outlook. It was rather difficult because there are in, on the modeling side, it's difficult to put figures be behind this uh, and, uh, and we, often don't have the numbers. And, uh, and here, um, what it shows is that really, these polls show that all of the measures are important, have some social aspects. And uh, we really, uh, we are trying to reflect these aspects in the models. Uh, this outlook shows the first trial to do so. And we aim on improving our representation of, uh, of social and resilience aspects in the future with switching from mobility to accessibility approaches. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mallory. Um, so we can now start taking some questions from our audience. Um, and we have a question here from Nathaniel, which is a, a marked as a question for Joshua, but I think probably either of you could um, comment on this. So it comes to the, the focus of um, the source of the carbon emissions for our models. Um, and the question is essentially, why take just you know, the immediate tailpipe emissions? Shouldn't the ITF also be looking at overall emissions? So uh, from the manufacture of batteries and other energy storage systems, so life cycle um, emissions. Um, I'm not sure which of you, Joshua, do you want to take the first response on that? Great, thank you. Thank you, and of course, uh, Mallory can jump in and complement my answer. But on this, I think that this question is essential. Uh, the idea is to be able to take into account both direct and indirect emissions. And this is because, especially when we think about uh, electrification, at the end of the day, these measures are not going to be successful unless the actual energy mix that generates this electricity is taken into account and is clean as well. So um, in, the, in the outlook, we did take into account these uh, different sources of, of emissions, but of course, there needs to be uh, further attention in the future on this. And uh, you can actually read a little bit of how these um, shares of direct versus indirect emissions evolve in the future. In, in the future, actually, if we uh, put on measures that seek to clean vehicle fleets, then the indirect uh, emissions stemming from uh, road transport is going to increase its share depending on how clean the electricity matrix is. So this is going to be key. Great, thanks, Joshua. Uh, Mallory, do you have anything to add on that? Mm, not much. Um, well, what we can say, it's, it's also why uh, electrifying the, the vehicle fleet, why technology improvement is not the only solution because there are always drawbacks at some point. Uh, we really must uh, have the whole set of measures with measures enabling, enabling to, uh, to shifting modes and to, uh, and to avoiding some trips that are not necessary. Great, thank you, Mallory. 
Um, okay, so and thank you to Nathaniel for the question. So we have a question here also then from Alana, um, and this relates to we talk a lot about public transport in this session and the last one. Um, but here's a question on what are the opportunities and policy measures for formalizing informal public transport services? And is this a priority? And Joshua, I can see you nodding. So I'm going to ask you to respond on this one, please. Of course, formalization uh, in developing regions is essential. And the way it's done can actually shape in the future our emissions and how sustainable systems are. If you look at uh, the paratransit share, informal transport share in developing regions, you see that in our most ambitious scenario, we assume a certain formalization rate that can allow these paratransit services to be integrated into shared mobility. And this integration is what allows thanks to a strong public transport system for the most emissions reduction. But this is assuming that formalization takes place in a way that's properly integrated with public transport. If this is not the case, then on the opposite, uh, expansion of informal services in the future would actually be very detrimental to uh, the evolution of emissions. So the way in which formalization takes place is, is essential. Now, we didn't look too much into the political economy of how these changes would need to take place because these are very context specific. But it's crucial that when formalizing, these informal transport services become integrated in a sustainable manner into the public transport services of cities in developing regions. Great, thank you, Joshua. Um, and just while we're on the public transport, a quick question I have, which I think probably will come up, uh, and Mallory, excuse me, perhaps you could answer this one. Um, so we, we talk about public transport being the backbone, but in our most ambitious scenario, in fact, it's, it's mode share on a trip basis appears to be lower than in the other scenarios. So perhaps you could just uh, make some comment on that for our audience, please. Yeah, thank you, Ola. Um, yeah, clearly this is a, an interesting question. And uh, it, when we look at the results, it's, uh, it's first disturbing to show this share that is diminishing or possibly staying the same. But uh, when we look at these figures, we must uh, also consider that the demand is growing, is growing a lot. Uh, so actually, if we look at the, at the values of the demand for public transport, it is increasing. It is not, it, the only thing is that it is not increasing as much as other, as other modes. Uh, so it's here, it's growing. Uh, we need public transport, uh, but in the mocha, it's less visible because uh, shared mobilities are also developing a lot to, um, to capture the, the area of the demand that are less um, difficult to capture by public transit because it's not efficient enough for this. Uh, there's not the density, for instance. Uh, so um, yes, public transport is there even if the mode share is slightly decreasing. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that, Mallory. Um, so we have a question here then from Ada on uh, automated vehicles. So how can automated vehicles be integrated into urban mobility systems to facilitate accessibility to opportunities? And Joshua, I think probably this one to you, um, please. Uh, your thoughts on automated vehicles and urban mobility. Of course. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. The automation of vehicles in the future can be a way of integrating publics that right now have a difficult time being integrated into the whole transport system at the urban level, for instance, people with discapacities. So this is definitely uh, an alternative and a solution that needs to be taken into account. However, automated vehicles themselves will not be a panacea. And this means that if we don't take into account very carefully uh, the way in which these automated vehicles work, if we don't take into account their environmental impacts, we can end up with cities that have many automated vehicles, which end up generating many empty trips and a lot of congestion. So, of course, a good solution that can in the future help bring access to a wider am amount of users, but one which need to be, needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Thank you, Joshua. And Mallory, I can see you nodding emphatically. Would you like to add a comment to Joshua's response? Yes, well, uh, what Joshua said is definitely true and it depends on the model on which uh, these automated vehicles are developed. Uh, if it's to replace private vehicles by private automated vehicles, um, 
there is uh, a strong likelihood that um, it would uh, generate a lot of empty trips in the cars who would just travel empty uh, while developing, uh, well, um, having uh, automated vehicles based on a shared mobility system would be probably much more efficient. So uh, it depends on how they will evolve in the future. Thank you, Mallory. And Marusha, I saw you appear briefly on screen there. Would you like to add a comment on uh, in response to this question, please? Well, a bit of a mix in response to the previous ones, if I may, Orla. Of I course, mean, please and, do. Uh, an automatic private car remains a private car on the road, as, as Mallory was saying. So I think that's my only answer <laughs> to this one, as much as, of course, it can serve to providing access for all, as Joshua was also saying. And I think I would like to bring here as well our attention to a to a study recently commissioned by the German government, which came with the following um, came up with the following findings: that something like forty percent of uh, the potential for emission reductions in transport will come from technology, whereas sixty percent of the potential for reductions of emissions will come from behavioral change and from shifting modes. So I think that tells us a lot. And then a word about um, public transport. I think that we shouldn't forget that the the, the plummeting ridership is a behavioral aspect that all of us as citizens, we have to be thinking about. We are all going back to our cars on the streets, on the roads of our cities, because we all have different fears in this pandemic moment. So it's about, I think, working with that social psychology, with that, uh, with all those different vectors that are super interesting. And because there was a question on informal transit, and because my team this morning flagged up to me, super interesting reading from SAAT, Myths and Realities of Informal Public Transport in Developing Countries. 17 myths to be debunked that I would absolutely recommend to those who are keen on the informal transport and want to compliment the wonderful job of DSA Outlook 2021. So thanks a lot, Orla. Thank you very much for that, Marusha. And perhaps the team could find that link and share it in the discussion box. And in fact, while I have you, Marusha, perhaps I can I can uh, press you for a second answer if that's okay. We have a question here from Nicola on the role of the private sector. So while we're talking about what the different um, parties can do, we've spoken about policymakers. What do you think mm -hmm. the the role of the public sector could be in uh, in achieving that decarbonisation? Of the private sector, the role of the private, private apologies, private, yeah. yes. No, I mean, I think there's a nest, I mean, an essential role here. I think that we shouldn't at all underestimate or neglect the innovation potential that so oftentimes comes straight from the private sector. Perhaps the friendly nuance I would add up to it is how are we going to be enabling innovation that somehow is connected to public policy goals for that access to urban mobility options, isn't it? But that private innovation must be absolutely uh, enabled with different uh, uh, legal certainties and institutional frameworks. And another aspect that I think we shouldn't neglect at all is that in many geographies, informal public, informal, informal transport services are actually private sector operated. So private sector, of course, needs to make profit. We shouldn't forget that. And if those private sector operated services collapse in many cities across the world, it's gonna mean that no mobility options are gonna be there, except for those who can actually own a car from the minority who can own a car. So I think that absolutely the best combination would be to see governments at national level and at city level and private sector working together in integrated manners and, and, and the governments at their level of responsibility enabling regulatory fiscal and policy frameworks that actually allow the private sector to do what they are super good at doing, which is filling market gaps, promoting innovation, and putting on the market solutions that many oftentimes the public sector cannot really um, uh, invest in. Thanks. And thanks for the question to Nicola, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Marusha. And apologies for being cheeky and keeping you on there when uh, when when you had offered to answer another question. So <clears throat> we have two more questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, for anyone who has any remaining questions or would like to discuss the outlook in more detail, uh, members of the ITF team will be at the ITF exhibition stand over the course of the conference. So do please feel free to pop along and um, submit any questions you have there or discuss with my colleagues um, if they are on the stand. So unfortunately, as I say, we are out of time for the urban session. It has been very interesting, if a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, I would like to say a very big thank you to Marusha for joining us today, for sharing her insights and for joining the discussion panel at the end. 
Um, for those of you looking for more information on the Outlook, uh, the Outlook itself is available on the ITF Outlook page, along with uh, downloadable summaries and links to the statistic, the OECD statistics, um, where the results can also be downloaded. If you do uh, go to the ITF exhibition stand, there are executive summaries of the Outlook available in several languages, um, which you may find useful. And otherwise, all that is left is for me to encourage you to please stick with us again. My colleague Melisi will be taking over moderation for the non-urban passenger uh, session, which follows in five minutes time. Uh, you can navigate to that by using the back to timeline choice on the top of your screen and selecting the morning session for non-urban passenger transport. But otherwise, I wish you all a very good day and thank you very much for joining us.